good morning everybody yeah. Yeah, really i am really very happy uh, to address you on this morning uh, in fact uh, I, when i see such a crowd i feel very young eh? because uh, the message i want to carry is for the young people uh, to take it forward see i am not going to talk about the type of accomplishments what we have done i would like to talk only on what is the type of uh, himalayan tasks that are really lying ahead for the young generation so that you can scale so far that we want to give a just a glimpse of uh, what is being done and what can be done what should be done okay then the rest of it it's uh, uh, at the end of it you also will feel uh, the very idea is to stir the imagination okay i i i feel i think that uh, you may may be students from all uh, branches probably am i right yeah, yeah. and uh, mostly uh, uh, graduate students am i uh, undergraduate students yeah am i right yeah okay yeah so now fine yeah uh, today's uh, space ro i i would like to talk about uh, space robotics See, in our uh, ISRO, if you see, you are all uh, uh, associate with uh, rockets or launch vehicles and spacecrafts which uh, lie in the orbit. So this is the normal, uh, what your perception and associated applications associ associated with uh, communication, uh, remote sensing and all the other things which are directly have access to our li life. Now, uh, today, I would like to talk space robotics for exploration as well as for sustenance. How we are going to sustain our activity in space in the due course of uh, time I will uh, discuss. So, uh, emerging, emerging trends in on-orbit servicing assembly and manufacture, that is what I have tried to put it forth. And one idea is to put the challenges ahead, what is the lying there and what you can grab and what you will take it forward. So today's uh, uh, I, overview, if you look, so, uh, yeah, just uh, space robotics. What is the space robotics all about? And humanoid in a space robot as well as free flying robot. I think this is something may, you may be, I mean, uh, I may be introducing to you. And uh, then challenges and key technologies involved, then emerging trends in on-orbit servicing, assembly and manufacture if you say space robotics overview see in the area of space it is one of the modern area the since the environment of uh, the space is extreme when we say extreme with respect to the uh, temperatures with the radiation the type of vacuum and the lack of gravity so these are all pose a lot of challenges. What you don't face or what we don't face in a terrestrial robotics environment. Then <coughs> these things have to be, suppose if you want to send a, a, a robot along with an astronaut, then it should be a human companion like. That means it is exactly should have the capability, the feelings, the perceptions, and everything like a human being. So therefore, this is very, very, uh, very, very important aspect when you are designing uh, a space robot, especially a humanoid. And uh, one of the most important aspect is the build intelligence and dexterity. See, once you launch, you are verifying the capability testing in the ground with the uh, 1G condition. We try to do simulations of 0G. But once you are in orbit, it should have the capability to adapt itself and the dexterity. That is what the emerging uh, variations in the uh, scenario, it should, should be able to adopt. This is one of the very uh, critical uh, uh, challenge that posed for an autonomous activity in space. Today, if you see a spacecraft, limited autonomy is there, smaller activities which are conceived, the problems which will be conceived, for which how exactly it has to act, that has been uh, put forth into the program, so that uh, 
uh, it acts as an autonomous. Whereas here what we are talking about is uh, uh, certain scenarios which has not been envisaged, which has not been visualized. When it encounters, it shall the capability to respond and come out successfully with. So here there is a basic uh, on-orbit servicing. Why is this on-orbit servicing? Uh, all this manufacture, etc. I will uh, try to cover in uh, subsequently, as well as in situ resource utilization. Suppose if you have in the moon surface, you have certain resources which can be used as a propul propulsion element and as a propellant, it can be used. If we should be able to cap capable of making use of those resources. So, uh, why that robots for on orbit operations? See, I have shown here one picture of uh, uh, 19, 19th uh, 100 to say something around uh, 2013. In now around us, there is n number of non-functional objects, which is the debris that is uh, accumulating in space. And uh, of late, you are all uh, must be very familiar with space links, WebEx, for which India, we also launched their uh, satellites. There's constellation of satellites. Earlier concept of uh, satellite, communication satellite, you all know in a geosynchronous 36,000 RPM, uh, 36,000 kilometer, it stays there. And then as a communication, it serves the India, the subcontinent for uh, maybe uh, 10 years, 15 years, uh, or even up to uh, 17, 18 years, depending on the type of sensors and the actuators what we put. So just to, to deviate, uh, basic ISRO inertial system uh, unit, our primary requirement is with the inertial sensors for navigation, guidance, and control of rockets or launch vehicles, as well as uh, inertial referencing for all spacecrafts and inertial actuators. How do we orient? That means attitude is attitude determination is inertial referencing, and then the how it is to be oriented. So you have uh, a, a car or a vehicle, you steer, you can uh, really uh, orient. If it's an aircraft, you the radar or the uh, control surfaces are manipulated and it can rotate. Have you ever seen, uh, thought of how a, space, a spacecraft where there is no air, nothing is there, how it is being steered? It is b basically steered by what is something called reaction wheels. They are basically momentum exchange devices so that it's simple means if I say layman's language, if I say you take a flywheel, you rotate in one direction, the spacecraft starts rotating in the other direction in the ratio of the inertia in involved. So what we have is a smaller inertia we put forth. And so why I came to into this topic is I said some spacecrafts survive for 10 years, 15 years. So every spacecraft, four of our wheels are running 24 by 7 non-stop for this 15 years. You can see that is a, it's a, uh, uh, till recently we are conventional ball bearings. Now of course magnetically limited uh, 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 reaction wheels are also we have put in the orbit, which run flawlessly for the required lifetime. Once our wheels, if they come across any failure or their end of life, they reach, it is only a matter of few days for which the satellite can survive. So that is a type of critical technology with respect to the uh, ball bearing, rolling elements, rot rotating elements, rotor dynamics, etc. which as well as uh, uh, another very challenging uh, thing, I will, I will come up subsequently probably, the challenges with respect to the environment, once again I will come back. So, so now what happens is, there are a lot of uh, uh, debris as well as useful uh, elements are, because for SpaceX and all, now for the same communication, what now they put is uh, thousands of uh, satellites across the globe, because it's at a lower height, so that they will be keep on uh, moving out, but they will have a handshake with the rest. So they do the function of uh, being almost like a stationary uh, spacecraft. What is uh, involved is, when you are putting 2,000 or 2,500 or 3,000 satellites, some of the satellites, they can go back. Then immediately they join the uh, list of the debris. 
now even today when we are launching you would have seen we are launching at 9 hours 58 minutes and some seconds these are primarily done to steer away from some of the debris also as active because uh, when you launch you should not come and uh, hit another debris or even an active so that is now it is so crowded so crowd of course traffic jam etc i think uh, mumbai it's, uh, you are very very familiar with uh, so the similar thing is going to happen uh, the same place there here at least traffic regulation is there of course now as on today no regulation and uh, even the junk vehicles so, so here active vehicles are going around you imagine a situation everybody says when their old vehicle also they put into your uh, in the road and leave it is as good as the scenario in the uh, um, uh, orbit is like that so now there is a real requirement for debris management what suppose how do we manage suppose a yeah, uh, uh, spacecraft fails by certain means if i can enable to work again normally then that is also a debris management a positive management and it cannot be recovered i should be able to uh, bring it back if it is uh, too expensive to bring it back i should be able to do something so that it uh, burns off itself uh, entering the uh, earth's atmosphere so this management that, that means what if i want to increase the life of a spacecraft uh, which is working perfectly only the fuel is out i can should be able to refuel or small corrections some in our solar panel some uh, damage has come uh, de degradation where i should be able to replace and go ahead so an assembly activity then uh, similarly for uh, uh, really you want to recover and bring it back so th these are what we called as on orbit operation o cube and this on orbit operation then on orbit inspection servicing as well as uh, debris and these are all the debris removal this is what is involved in a spot smart robotic satellite yeah so now another is why uh, robots for space exploration so suppose before sending a crewed mission the way i i will talk about uh, predecessor to crewed mission this is exactly for the gaganyaan we are uh, sending new mitra our homemade uh, robot and we will discuss further on it as a social companion when the, there is a crew then as a crew assistant as well as do some uh, on orbit assembly activity it has to do or on orbit servicing similarly planetary exploration planets like mars mars where you can really send a uh, humanoid and uh, uh, try to replicate what exactly a human will do and without taking the risk one important point or you all should know is come what may the people go to the space stay there for a longer time their health conditions get affected biologically there is a, a risk that is okay of course there are measures trying to uh, what you call uh, delay as well as uh, decrease the effects but there are negative effects so a yeah, uh, humanoid if you say it can afford to uh, sustain for a long time provided it is designed and developed accordingly okay so now space robotics if you say uh, robotic arms which you would have had in iss primarily as well as rovers even the moon rover what we are talking indian rovers as well as uh, uh, european as well as uh, us or any many rovers have landed in the moon or in the other surfaces <coughs> then humanoids and free flyers today i will be just talking about humanoids as well as the free flyers uh, robots so contemporary terrestrial robots many of you must be the especially robo enthusiasts must be very very uh, sure of the details of each one this is about the terrestrial robots when it comes to the global scenario in the uh, space uh, humanoid uh, this is r2 is one head and torso uh, which is developed with 42 degrees of freedom and it has been flown to international space station in a packed container it is packed sent and then it is uh, made up at, at the iss now valkyrie is a 
full fledged biped, but it has been only made, it has not been flown. And on the last, what you see is the our uh, Bumitra, uh, it is uh, anthropomorphic. So, this is the first time an anthropomorphic uh, uh, human, humanoid is flying to in, in a rocket and uh, in the first unmanned mission of Gaganyan, it is flying and it is an uh, AI -A -A enabled and why it is AI enabled and what its roles, I will discuss further. So, before the manned mission, we want to really simulate the conditions, what the type of uh, uh, things it is experiencing and what I have shown here is the uh, crew module. The crew module, it is the launch posture because during the launch, heavy loads. Uh, why I say anthropomorphic uh, humanoid has not been flown is, uh, it, it is uh, riding in a launch vehicle is not joy ride. That is uh, very tough in the sense, severe vibrations, shocks uh, and the acoustic noise that really is uh, very, very uh, challenging for even mechanical structures. So, that is exactly what we try to do. But uh, now when you want to <coughs> uh, send a, a humanoid, almost like a human, uh, exactly like a human size and shape and with all these features, uh, see you can, you could have seen the R2 what had been flown, uh, the face is uh, only like a helmet sort of a thing. Uh, it does not have any expressions or any, any other aspect like a human. But uh, uh, subsequently, I will show where uh, the what we are talking is uh, uh, a, a humanoid where it can really behave, look alike, look like as well as uh, to the extent of thinking process also similar to a human and the, its similar perceptions. So, here what we have uh, uh, trying to is uh, the biggest change is uh, it has the functional aspects as well as the social capabilities and designs to withstand the launch conditions and function autonomously in orbit and uh, learning from the environment. That is, this is what we are really targeting uh, with respect to that. What you see here is the, that is a cradle at which the uh, Vyumitra will be standing and then it will be coming to a uh, position where uh, after reaching the orbit and it is held with uh, um, magnetic locks during launch. So, here a view of uh, uh, without its uh, uh, the dress coat etc or the makeup what you, ca you can see is on the left side. So, this is a Vyamutra head. This head has got some tall mechanisms inside. See when you want to smile, when you want to la laugh or when you want to really uh, grim face etc. So, there are lot of uh, actuators are there which you need to be, the, the, see you know within the head you have to accommodate so many mechanisms, fine mechanisms, then they should sustain uh, the vibration and the horse environment, vacuum environment. Here one important aspect what we have seen is, here you have, uh, you can see a motor, a uh, uh, bearing and metal to metal contact and we are, you know, you all you know that if I lubricate then it will run very f nicely everything. Whereas in space, under vacuum conditions, what happens is two metal to metal when they make a joint and especially when they make a small rubbing during the launch at the in the orbit, they get cold welded. This is a very biggest challenge. So, every surface that is bound to make a relative motion or etc. has to be tribologically conditioned, then only they will operate. So, this is our first major difference between a uh, ho homemade terrestrial robo to a, what is there in the space. So, then the type of uh, engineering that is involved in the surface engineering, how you see one is a manufacturer, then how each surfaces are, how the tri tribological conditions are modified such that uh, uh, they happily do perform as they had been doing in the uh, ground also. So, now just I have given a glimpse of uh, and then the, the other some of the challenges I will come back. Now, we talk about uh, free flying robots. Uh, free flying robots uh, around the world globally, uh, some, some spears or uh, in, in, international ball 2017, they are primarily for just floating elements to inspect. But with a camera, 
it goes around ISS or any other spacecraft to inspect. And Astro B is the one latest where in the ISS, where now in the ISS inside it is one atmosphere and of course zero G. So now how it is, it, it because of zero G it will be just uh, floating and then what happens is uh, with the uh, fan it can just move around. Whereas the SSR, what we are talking is smart space robo, what we have uh, designed is and this astrobi also has got very small arms, uh, very small tiny arms to hold the door etc. Ours is uh, basically to work outside the environment, not inside one, one atmosphere, one bar, it is in the uh, uh, extreme vacuum conditions. So that is a challenge, some of the challenges, what, <coughs> I am sorry. Astrobi faces uh, will not be faced by a smart and will uh, what uh, Astrobi doesn't face uh, will be faced by a smart space robot. So, just uh, to give a space robotic free flyers, this is uh, some detail. And uh, Astrobi, on the uh, bottom left, you what you see uh, free flying robot for in, in intra vehicular uh, movement of ISS it has a perching arm just to hold on to that and a docking station for charging and data transfer. It can go to a dock to a place, charge itself, etc. So that capability. So with respect to this, uh, uh, earlier versions are remote controlled or teleoperated where you don't really need, uh, you cannot have the uh, flexibility of the type of activity what we intend to do now. And uh, ISRO's uh, SSR, what we have developing into and drum is uh, 20, 20 kilogram, 30 watt power, two robotic arms, cold gas thrusters for translation, attitude sensors and actuators, mission sensors. This is about the prime thing which uh, slightly I will touch upon subsequent two. So it's an, a nano class robotic satellite, capability to depart from a mother ship, go around, inspect and then return to the base or dock back to the base. This is what the uh, proof of concept. Uh, so another very important thing is, see here now I am waving, I mean moving my arms, etc. Uh, it nothing happens to me because the reaction goes to the ground and I mean at the interface of my traction, my the way the, uh, the friction, etc. It takes care that I am very stable. But uh, in a uh, spacecraft uh, which is uh, in the orbit, if you just move one arm like this, the whole body tumbles because there is uh, nothing to uh, support this. So in this robotics, there is a very important uh, challenge. You need to move your arm, but without reaction being exerted. It's possible. We can do it. A combination of uh, activity, a somewhat say even, you know, uh, end effectors, uh, the final point you lock and you do all the other motions, no? Uh, to so similar to avoid singularities, we certain maneuver in uh, terrestrial robotics. So similar activity can be has to has to be done, but it has to be very fair because it is very challenging that uh, you cannot re that reaction wheels are there, small reaction wheels are there, but uh, unless we minimize, when I say reactionless, uh, the the residue will be a very negligible, which will be well within the uh, capability of the uh, manipulating. I mean actuators. So, uh, vision based and AI enabled. You know this uh, vision based, uh, um, dr this driverless uh, uh, vehicles, no? Now, nowadays what is coming up. But uh, they are not deterministic. Even today they will say 86 percent, 90 percent and different climbs. But uh, uh, how to make it deterministic? You cannot afford to have uh, uh, this, uh, uh, such uncertainty in orbit. Yeah, whereas here is a, a driver at least watches and uh, I mean uh, takes over if there is a, really a need. Whereas there, uh, the need to be resolved then and there, then mission based navigation is uh, another challenge is lot of computation. See the, the way I am now looking at uh, my brain is computing so much so that I am able to decipher all the activity. So therefore, the type of number crunching that is demand is huge for a vision based navigation system. But 
in orbit you have resources or computing resources are limited you cannot afford to have a cloud what we have here on to the orbit so that sort of a demands uh, so for a enabled navigation is there how do we uh, address this so newer algorithms uh, which uh, are to be there where uh, they are uh, more uh, efficient in number crunching then electromagnetic docking and attitude and translation control uh, primarily this is a type of refueling or servicing space debris management and uh, collecting and inspection these are some of the, uh, the application that has been thought of now uh, this is one small attitude control that i said no that when you want to maintain attitude so what here you what you see is this uh, ssr is now kept on a air bearing try to simulate the zero g condition it is kept on an air bearing and then attitude is being there so reaction wheels are uh, working inside and they are really uh, moving seeing the gyros are sensing as well as the vision based uh, the camera will capture the targets and accordingly this uh, uh, space I mean base is maneuvered so now as you come into the application as i earlier said extending spacecraft mission life increased payload capacity to generate more revenue that means initially itself less fuel more payload later you refuel then orbital uh, uh, orbital propellant depot see today we make bigger see we had slv pslv gslv uh, launch lvm3 vehicles with their capability going up and up what is to carry more and more and we make bigger and bigger and more powerful rockets suppose you imagine a scenario where we lift off uh, with a saturn say for mars we take so many days for to move to mars because of uh, our constraint with respect to the propulsion capability now if if i am able to move up to the um, orbit with one rocket and another rocket carrying a fuel and if you can refuel it then it is uh, so high because the type of uh, you carry one ton from ground uh, what uh, what it uh, benefits other than one ton is available in orbit that make a huge difference in the performance ca uh, capability so even with our existing uh, uh, capability without going for mega uh, sizes the technology uh, can be made such that we can make use of it so that is one of the major so here the concept is a tank tanker spacecraft will go with the propellant and a refuel a, a, a micro chaser chasers docks fuels it come back so it is like uh, on demand yeah, the fuel is being transported back so uh, these are all done i mean said very easily so the challenges only we will uh, see here as i earlier said so two bodies are uh, in our space you know they are tra both are traveling at very high velocity and they are uh, the plane of orbital plane even if it's a small difference when they touch that is huge reaction because the component of this velocity will be very huge even imagine they are at one plane in the other plane fractions of uh, our second the other fellow is tilted then the relative velocity between them will be very huge so when they touch the, the either the, it is like uh, uh, that hit and uh, fall back eh? both can fly off eh? so that is a, such a scenario a uh, yeah, newer concept the uh, what was uh, done is for cooperative targets only you can do this non cooperative targets means which is uh, uh, dead that it means not cooperate not cooperating because not because of uh, arrogant but it is basically a performance is there it is tumbling what we call it as non cooperative when you want to hold we have a new concept of variable impedance robotic arm for berthing so when it comes and holds it is something like uh, it is like the flexibility will be so high this arm will be like a rope when it touches now reaction will be translated back so that means what now uh, any um, non cooperative fellow can be done but then the same arm regains its stiffness and comes to so slowly it becomes rigid then what happens now these two bodies are rigidly linked so this concept it has got challenges with respect to materials uh, for mechanical engineers for metallurgists for control system engineers uh, for <coughs> mechanism people tribologists and uh, 
uh, everybody under the uh, engineering branch, uh, as well as uh, chemical engineers, uh, all this uh, people, thin film uh, experts, all this are coming in picture when you really want to make use of a uh, variable impedance. So this is what I am, what we are talking about. See, we want to introduce the problem, the challenges. When you are uh, touching another body in uh, orbit, uh, these are the biggest challenges. So similar con newer concepts should emerge where we should be able to take care. Then why we are saying is we have to do things in a very simple way. Then only it will be cost effective because tomorrow there is a big need for debris management is coming up. It is not only for uh, what you call uh, technology development or showing off, it is for commercial application. Soon companies will have to come from right uh, uh, engineers from you where uh, see debris management, Indian based debris management startups should come where we should be able to capture and dispose that sort of an activity. So now uh, it, it is basically uh, capture and this you cannot capture unless otherwise you have a <coughs> relative orientations fixed between that body and this. So these are the biggest challenges with respect to navigation, guidance and control and approach another object. So that is, once that is approached and you are held, then any concepts of uh, uh, normally, you see people are now, we are envisaging like attaching a small rocket and orienting and firing it. Then what happens is the orbit will become elliptical. When it is elliptical, soon it will die an elliptical orbit after soon it will die and it will crash burn off into the atmosphere so there are different ways of doing but uh, approaching and holding uh, an object uh, in space that is the biggest challenge so there only this uh, adaptable intelligent robotics uh, comes in so when you say the key challenges as i earlier said the space environment launch loads thermal extremes and the radiation it is not the thermal radiation, but also the other uh, radiations from the sun and uh, uh, communication delays in case if you do a teleoperation, that's what we cannot do. Microgravity manipulation, so what we, uh, the field, real microgravity, what we will be seeing, seeing there and high performance embedded system for AA tasks, that's what we, uh, as I was mentioning, the type of two, two approaches are done better and better processes are being developed for with AA capability. Another one is you get better and better algorithms which are not uh, this num uh, processing thirsty, uh, number crunching thirsty, uh, such out, I mean um, algorithms also has to be developed. Then autonomous and exigency mode, fault detection and mitigation, robust and reliable systems with redundancy. So this is what uh, uh, challenges in a space robotics is all about. Uh, so now the key technologies, you have said, sensing and perception. That is the biggest uh, element that is in uh, uh, space robotics. And then comes this uh, manipulation, which out really introducing much of a reaction onto self as well as the other body. Uh, system level autonomy and interactive tasks. So if it is suppose we are if you are going to talk with the cooperative um, object, how do we have an interactive task? and navigation and guidance control, as I said, and the type of mobility, how you move from. See, see uh, when you want to fuel, uh, you should not waste the fuel so much. So that uh, in order to fuel, you will carry the same equal number of fuel should not be consumed. So that's a uh, type of mobility what we have to uh, talk about. So there, uh, to address this, uh, the structure of the robotics, uh, processing electronics, the sensors, actuators, controls AA and uh, test, the testing, uh, testability in the ground. So establishing testability in the ground, that's are the other challenges. Then uh, for uh, mechanical engineers, you will see absence of convective heat transfer. Any electronics, when it gets heated up, you know, we will put a fan and we will solve the uh, thermal issue. So in the orbit, you don't have this uh, uh, convective heat transfer. Then loss of material. Because of that deep vacuum and environment, the material loss also happens. 
and obviously when there is a loss there is a contamination as well as cold welding which i earlier mentioned then embrittlement of material with the time in the orbit they change uh, adhesive bonding they weaken increased friction structural uh, distortion and jamming of mechanisms primarily the cumulative effects of all the left hand side whatever i have uh, mentioned so this results in uh, high strength low density materials precision fabrication additive manufacturing and uh, special materials with uh, uh, tml and cvcm that is what what it vaporizes the content what it vaporizes at that uh, 10 power minus 8 uh, millibar that sort of uh, numbers uh, one important thing you should visualize is we say vacuum but uh, near the spacecraft it will be 10 power minus 8 millibar that sort of a uh, pressure level it will be there so as it uh, move away then that there will be a uh, uh, finer and even uh, lower vacuum and all this miniature mechanisms which are capable of working in orbit has to be done now, now uh, this is a, a generic uh, precision manufacturing what we are involved for the type of sensors for the glass machining uh, or on the left hand bottom you have seen a humanoid torso what is being machined fully machined out from a um, block of material with a pi axis uh, uh, machining ultrasonic milling machine and the same thing has been done with 3d printing as well as so that uh, the type of effort because it has gone for some three months of uh, uh, machining that has resulted and other elements for the micro thrusters right hand side what you have seen uh, shown is the micro thrusters which are, we are using in the smart space robo where <coughs> i'm sorry we will be uh, fine thrust we create so that we move very cautiously and dock with the, uh, the corresponding member and uh, with additive manufacturing what we have uh, we are we have realized many apart from that humanoid skull with the lattice structure here i can say the challenge is exactly uh, identical mass like a typical skull but having much much higher strength to withstand the vibration shock so you you, you have seen a uh, uh, lattice uh, structure that is there they are very strong stiff but at the same time the effective density becomes much lower than aluminum actually it's a aluminum alloy made in aluminum alloy and uh, right hand side also you see the human arms etc all are 3d printed or made by additive manufacturing then one, one thing i want to talk about is the traditional design versus the generative design when we talk for optimizing the shape size of uh, space bond objects whether it is a space robo or any other thing uh, minimum mass maximum stiffness and the required conditions are to be met there you would have uh, mechanical engineers may be very aware that cad systems you do prismatic modeling that is you make from a block or a cylinder or a sphere or some shape and then what we do our operations to get a shape of a product but now the new concept you are bones what you see uh, every bone you know they are not rectangular or circular or any other any shape they are functionally designed they are appropriately material is distributed up appropriately whereas you cannot model them to start with unless other we for a functionally so you result in non optimal solutions this is what but when the additive manufacturing techniques have emerged so unless the design concepts also change we will not be able to get the best benefits of this adaptive manufacture so therefore yeah, what called as generative design design or organic design like that has come where you generate a model and appropriate area put the material and do then it will result in a very complex shape but it can be realized through additive manufacturing see this is uh, some of the generative designs uh, done by airbus uh, as well as uh, uh, space ryog outside where they are able to get 35 to 40% less mass 
but for the same stiffness. And uh, this is our story where uh, ganglion, the, the cradle or the base on which the uh, view mitra is suspended, and the left hand side uh, top, what you have uh, shown, is a conventional design to be made with additive manufacturing. That means hollow structures, whatever that is. But uh, uh, we were able to make few kilograms less than that. I think that was some 18 kilogram, uh, which is very difficult to make also. But whereas the, here it is something 14 kilogram, but 30 percent more stiff. That sort of a stiffness what is. This is a called regenerative generative design where uh, you should be able to make use of this uh, uh, techniques of additive manufacturing and then get into uh, where the best of it. So all our uh, your robo what you can see is now is made with the, the additive manufactured uh, components so that the best of possible, best what you can do with the design as well as are done. Now, we have uh, been talking about uh, orbit, uh, on orbit servicing, assembly and manufacturing. Now, I just mentioned about manufacturing something for the orbit. Now, we, I would like to talk on something if we can manufacture at or there in the orbit, whether you can. That is what is called, uh, what is the manufacturing what we are talking. So, on orbit servicing, assembly, uh, some hint of it. Are, uh, I have uh, given where very huge mirrors or very huge antenna can be assembled in space. You pack it with, the, because you know in a rocket that the top part that is called fairing, um, uh, that is a, uh, what do you call, payload fairing, where there is a payload or the spacecraft is held with a heat shield. It has got a definite shape. You cannot bring in big, large, wide um, bodies into it. Suppose an antenna, now what we do is, antennas up to 6 meters also, we fold it and it deploy. But you know, uh, there are limitations into that. Getting back the correct shape, etc. there are limitations. But 6 meters is okay. But I need 60 meters an antenna to be deployed in uh, space. So then the idea is, either take some pieces of uh, um, structures, put them in a box and uh, dismantle, I mean, there you do the assembly. And uh, some uh, activities have uh, started and uh, another, another important is a long boom structure has to be designed. How do we design? I mean, uh, designed and carried there. So instead, in situ manufacture it. In situ, you carry the raw material only from here and make 3D printing of it and do a structure and then bridge. Or uh, certain elements you make it from here, the bridging elements you 3D print. Or for some component is damaged where you need to make there and replace. So this is a uh, uh, sustenance in space uh, is, uh, is possible only with on orbit, uh, not only servicing, not only assembly, but also. Uh, so these are all really enabled by space robotics. So uh, this is only small scope what I am uh, talking about. but. Uh, Sky is the limit. Sky uh, for a space, even no sky is the limit. No limit. So, and uh, uh, some of this, whatever pe pe people out, out in have been sh done, I am just showing, uh, where uh, this of the type of activities are being shown for the, what do you call, not for operational, very convenient environment, these are being done. Whereas what's the demand for debris management is not so convenient. Uh, environment and uh, on orbit assembly it is not only assembly of structures assembly of uh, many satellites together to form a uh, configuration which can have uh, multifold increase the capability of it there are many other uh, methods where uh, that this is why you should have uh, the new thinking process uh, from the young generation so that things what was more difficult yesterday can be done with ease tomorrow. So that is all in your hands. Uh, the, that's what I said when I started. Uh, the basic, uh, uh, see there are a lot of advantages in manufacturing in space. You have zero gravity. Here you can make use of this gravity. So here if you uh, really you can uh, print and uh, keep it uh, floating. 
and complete it and then the way you want to you can be integrated. So these are the uh, very uh, important uh, uh, aspects on an on orbit um, activity where there are space robotics. So there that means what? You will have the sensors, the actuators as well as uh, the um, uh, number crunching, the type of electronics processing capability as well as new algorithms which may, can make it work deterministically uh, in, with the, the type of intelligence which is deterministic and then uh, um, that is adaptability to the, uh, to the scenario. So these are be, uh, some of the challenges. Uh, I, actually I have just put them uh, across whereas each area is a very in-depth area where multi-physics, multi-domain expert. And uh, uh, another thing is, uh, you may be uh, doing your courses here with the different branches, uh, but uh, uh, I can tell you, tomorrow, next generation, no product comes out from a single uh, engineering um, group. Uh, because everything now has to be a multi-physics environment, it has to be uh, taken care. And, uh, in fact, I can tell you now uh, some uh, under me some uh, 350 uh, engineering um, people are working. Uh, they belong to every branch of uh, uh, engineering, then physics, chemistry, of course, biology we don't have as on today. So uh, that is the type of environment that is required. So that is why uh, the way we stepped into this uh, space robotics, uh, even though uh, terrestrial robotics have, we have no uh, much uh, role. So this basic, when you say, uh, the key to future lies in the amalgamation of robotics technology with respect to its uh, control in micro G, dynamic path planning on the other, materials and manufacturing in space, and the satellite technology. That is uh, what is all right. It has to be integrated so that autonomous near and deep space operations can be done successfully so that uh, it's actually this area is a new business uh, what we talk about uh, uh, that debris management is emerging going to emerge as a very major uh, commercial activity for our survival in space so we need the imagination to get into how we ourselves can contribute uh, so uh, another aspect as what I was uh, telling with respect to when this sensors uh, for navigation, navigation sensors become uh, any aircraft or anywhere inertial navigation systems are there. And you know when they fly, uh, there will be an error accumulating and then it will be corrected by the GPS or navig our systems. But uh, you imagine a submarine which is underneath, uh, which need to lie in uh, uh, under the water for six months. Then, and if it is any aids it try to do, the enemy will find out where he is. It has to be silent. And at the same time, you should see the constantly, uh, what do you call, there is a disturbance. So the submarine will be drifting. You should exactly know where it is in the globe, you know, in the, with the location very exactly. Then only inertial sensors, that is gyros and accelerometers of that accuracy are required. So even six months, they say, we what we allow is they are 500 meters to one kilometer, they should be off. So such a uh, scenario, uh, we are all working with, uh, so far we are working with uh, uh, for manipulating the photons to do the measurement. Now currently uh, we are doing uh, activity with uh, atom. Uh, so I will ask, uh, anybody has seen an atom? Huh? You want to see? Uh, you come to us, <laughs> we will show you cloud of atoms. Eh? Visually we can show. That is, uh, you know, uh, why we are not able to see an atom is they are very small. Eh? And uh, they are, have high energy. Every every gas molecule atom, what you are talking about. So they will be just going around. They Because they have the temperature is high. Suppose if we are able to cool, 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 uh, you know, zero Kelvin, I am instead I will say micro Kelvin, 100 micro, micro Kelvin, 
50 micro kelvin, 20 micro kelvin. If you do that, they cool and they don't go off. Uh, they have they have the tendency to cloud around. So when they are clouded, cloud forms, we can see uh, through our digital camera. We can take pictures of it. Okay. So what we uh, do is uh, earlier we send two photons. I mean photons ray. Uh, two beams uh, across, and uh, when there is a rotation, hmm, uh, when it, there is a rotation, the beams which is uh, traveling in clockwise and the beam which is traveling in anti-clockwise, they will travel unequal distance because when they st the beam starts, you are here, and when it is there, then there is a rotation. So the, to reach the same place back, they they have traveled different. Now the same thing what we are doing is uh, because the weight of uh, mass number of uh, photon versus atom is so huge. So we are now use, making use of atom to do this uh, similar functions. Uh, why I am telling is, uh, see the type of uh, uh, challenges that are involved where uh, fundamental physics where we should be able to transfer into this. Uh, so, and there is another important application is deep space when you are uh, doing uh, we need, we cannot aid or anything we can do. Uh, celestial bodies, we take reference and go. But uh, we try to develop gyros, which will be stable for months together and where the attitude accuracy will be maintained. So this is a type of uh, uh, research that goes in, uh, in developing the type of sensors that are involved. And the another area is uh, even the sensors, current sensors performance can be enhanced with uh, machine learning. You learn on the fly. So here also, uh, vision-based navigation system, we are relying only on uh, learning on, because what happens is, when the light conditions change, uh, you know, the camera, the quality of the uh, 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 video changes with respect to what has been trained with. You know, artificial intelligence, you need uh, training. Uh, then there is a the S population. So certain scenarios, it doesn't, uh, the exact lighting conditions are not uh, simulated, so it should be able to adopt to that, recalibrate and rework. So these are the areas where uh, um, this is uh, software en engineering, or not software, primarily. <coughs> uh, algorithms development. Eh? So you are fundamental in uh, uh, ma mathematics and physics. Eh? That is what is really required, where we should be doing great wonders in the core area of engineering technology in uh, space robotics. Okay. Uh, thank you for being patient and listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your presentation has surely Thank you, sir. Your presentation has surely shed light on the incredible advancement in smart robots. Let's have a huge round of applause for this insightful session, everybody. As mentioned before, we are welcoming questions from the audience. Anybody from the audience, if you have some questions?
very purpose of me coming here and talking to you is uh, on this only. See, uh, earlier uh, on space, uh, everything uh, we were doing. Uh, anything into space, Indian space is this organization. Okay, now this uh, scenario we want to change. We want to see that uh, nearly some 17,000 of us are there throughout India. Uh, how 1.7 lakhs? or 70 lakhs people can contribute. Because there is a huge potential there. So it is not just coming to slow and working at all. That is gone. Those days are gone. And we don't want that also. Uh, of course, we are very proud of the, uh, the country uh, honors us uh, because of the effort and the achievements what we have done. But now it is, uh, we want to uh, empower the next generation. So that is why I want to come into Space robotics, you don't think in total. You totally come to your sensing area, uh, your actuator area, uh, or in the AA is specific to uh, uh, enhancing that. Or like that, that these are some of the area where, uh, see, you, you have to be an expert in one area, uh, as well as you should have a global view of uh, the other areas that is involved, the challenges involved. Then, yes, then there is, you see, like this, uh, so many uh, people, they, the thinking process starts, then it will be very dynamic. Okay, say, the concept of, uh, if I want to contribute for space, I have to join, so that should go. Eh? What, how I will beat it off in its, in its game? I think that is the thing what it is. <laughs> We belong to an edtech uh, company which is into astronomy and space sciences, and uh, that's how you know we know what the oil we call it the really fine oil edge too. Uh, does the inertia system unit uh, is it approachable for you know the two lead uh, catalysts? We could approach this. Say for example, we might we would want to reach out to you to help us you know get the Suzu community involved. Yeah. Is it possible, sir? Yeah, of course. Uh, not huge numbers, huh? Uh, because all our people, all our facility will be occupied, but uh, we are accommodating the students. We are accommodating. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think there is a limited time. Huh? Thank you. Thank you, sir. It has been an absolute honor and privilege to have Dr. D. Sam Dayal Dev as our chief guest for the inaugural ceremony of Technovanza 2023. We are grateful for his valuable insights on smart robots and it was indeed an inspiring session. As we conclude the inaugural ceremony, we would like to thank everyone for being a part of this momentous occasion. We hope that you will enjoy the rest of the events and activities planned for Technovanza 2023 and take away some valuable insights and experiences. We hope you enjoyed the session. I am Rushab Shah. And I am Srushti Poor. And until next time, this, this is, is Technovanza VJTI. Thank you so much, everyone.